everyone, and welcome back to Inside College Admissions, a SCORE podcast. We're excited for you to join us today for another conversation in our Deans of Admissions series. You'll hear from our guests about the fall semester during a pandemic, the admissions process, how schools are adapting, suggestions and advice for families, and much more. Our strategic advisor, Peter Van Buskirk, will guide us through the conversation today with our special guest. Now over to Peter for today's interview. Welcome to Inside College Admission, conversations with admission leaders about matters affecting the college going process. My name is Peter Van Buskirk. Earlier this year, I was able to chat with 20 deans of admission about the challenges posed to their institutions by the emerging coronavirus. Today, I am pleased that my good friend John Burdick, the Vice Provost for Enrollment at Cornell, has been able to break away from the credential review process to update us on college admission in the era of COVID-19. Welcome, John. Nice to see you, Peter. Well, it's good to have you back, and, and, and I, I have to say I'm impressed that I was able to get you back because uh, I can well imagine this is a very chaotic time for you and your colleagues in the admission office. Well, that's been true since the middle of March, so <laughs> might as well go for it. <laughs> how, is it how has it changed, though? Is there, have you seen a change in the kind of energy? I think when we talked in March and early April, you were projecting out possible solutions to the, the emerging coronavirus. Now we're eight to nine months later. How do things look for you on campus now? I think the things that we feel are entirely or at least very largely under our control, the ability to test our students, to make sure we're social distancing and offering our classes, tracking, monitoring, and then all the things in my domain and enrollment that we have needed to manage about changing enrollment standards and financial aid and admissions. I think we've, we've sort of won on all of those fronts. We're, we're, we're feeling pretty good about being science-based and being thoughtful and you know, being blessed to have the resources to do this right. But the wider world is still a whole other kind of thing mm-hmm. nationally and especially across the US. So we're, we're feeling that pinch like everybody, but sure. you know, in terms of what we can do right here in Ithaca, we're good. Excellent, excellent. Now, I, I, again, when we talked initially, there was a great deal of uncertainty, not only at Cornell, but among schools across the country about how the year would finish with regard to the entering cohort this fall. Would all of the students who had been admitted who said, yes, I'm coming, would they show up? Would you be able to accommodate them uh, on campus, remotely, whatever? How did that all work out? Did your fall semester come together as you'd hoped with A, the number of students you anticipated and, and B, with the kind of instruction that is productive for all? Yeah, we, we hit our target. We did a little more waitlist activity than usual to do that. And we had mm-hmm. a, a, quite a bit of an increase in students deferring, but we're talking going from 50 something to about 120. Mm-hmm. It's not a huge fraction of a first year class. It's over 3,200. About 75% of our new students, as well as 75% or so of our continuing undergraduates are on campus or in Ithaca, uh, as, as we would expect it. That allows us to de-densify in the, in the residence halls, but still have a, a real on-campus life. Uh, about 60% of our students were able to take an in-person class. And of those that can't, more than half were not living in Ithaca. They were by choice 100% remote or not always by choice for international students. So we didn't have that many students who came to Ithaca and then ultimately weren't able to take at least one class on campus. So that was a good result. And I think that first year students especially benefited from the ability to have some sense of community. Yeah, through masks and six feet away, but better than just being at home and trying to become part, identified as part of something without actually having any physical presence. Sure, sure. Now, I would imagine that you and your team are uh, about to emerge from an early decision reading process. Uh, have you noticed anything in terms of the the, the, the student interest this fall uh, in applications in general? It's still awfully early to know what the final tally will look like, but but early decision is often a, a marker that you can, can check early in the process to get a sense of how things are, are proceeding. Yeah, and I'll, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm almost reluctant and embarrassed to say this because I understand and have heard, at least through the grapevine, that there are some colleges and schools experiencing some pretty significant deficits or, or worrisome uh, changes in their applicant pool. At Cornell, we're up almost 40% in early decision applications. And in what we can track of our common app interests and starts, I don't think this will maybe ultimately hold up, um, but we're 25 or 30% ahead on regular decision as well. The leading part of that, but not an overwhelming part of that, is international students, which 
on some respects is also a surprise because of course international is, is the most challenged group and down most places overall. Uh, but I think this is something that I've seen before that when there's so much uncertainty about everything, uh, including economic circumstances ahead, and I'm sure that's been a driver for the current high school seniors, they are more likely than ever to want to make sure they've lined up a, a strong preparation at the college level. And so Cornell benefits from that kind of, it's almost, almost that kind of angst. It's enthusiasm, but it's angst at the same sure. time. So. Well, and it's interesting to look at the psychology of, of this whole thought process as well. In March and April, the students who would have been in the current applicant cohort must have been feeling some anxiety, looking at the uncertainty of the coronavirus and as it was still emerging. We didn't know to the extent to which things would be closed down. Can I go to college next year, et cetera? So it was understandable that you and others might have been concerned that we would see sort of a pullback of college going interest for this next year. But it, on the other hand, it seems now, now that we're almost into it for a year, the kids can't wait to get out. And college is representing an, an escape almost. Well, I think for a, for a high school senior, the idea that they can have something better by this time next year and be on a college campus and doing all the things that they like to do is probably enormously appealing. They're probably fighting for that every chance they get and in every way. I, I know I would be. Um, and there's probably there's probably two other things going on. I mentioned that sort of flight to quality response. That's standard. We're not unique in that. Our IV peers that we've talked to have got big double digit increases in applications too. But there's two other things that are uh, true of Cornell that I think are, are interesting. One is we have handled the pandemic particularly well and even relative to peers, we've been able to be open for such a large fraction of our students. They've been able to have a healthy experience of being on a college campus. Um, so that's a good thing. And the other thing that I'm pretty proud of is that Cornell saw early on the level of anxiety these high school seniors were experiencing around the issue of testing. And so we were among the very first of the 200 or so selective colleges that have moved to test optional and score free. We were among the first in April to say, this is what we'll do. So we were able to get out ahead of most peers that would make that change during late spring and early summer. We made it early enough to sort of communicate that to students that we don't need you to do this. And I think students, as they were developing their list, maybe took that into account. We, we have a very low uh, incidence of students submitting scores. So the, the message is definitely out there that Cornell is well prepared to read without yeah. test scores this year. Interesting. So you, when you say low incidence, so that, does that mean then the preponderance of current applicants, early decision and otherwise, are students applying without test results? Well, we don't know yet for regular decision, but early decision, yeah, it's it's very low. Our, our rates are just above 50% for the four colleges that are test optional. The submission rates are more like 15 to 25%. So that's taking our overall average way down. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to just kind of deal with semantics for a moment. You've mentioned a couple of times the, the score free uh, as opposed to test optional. How would you help the, the listener understand the difference there? I should back up. People may not realize this entirely, but Cornell's actually got seven different review processes that support the seven different colleges and different directors and reader mm -hmm. uh, organizations that do that. It's, it's a complex, exciting environment. In the Johnson College of Business, which is both the School of Hotel Administration and, and the Dyson School of uh, Economic Management, and in our Arts and uh, our, our Agriculture and Life Sciences School, and in our Arts, Architecture, and Planning School, they're not looking at scores at all. Those readers, even if a score has been submitted, those readers don't see it. That's score free. Yeah, it's score free. Two thirds of our Cornell entering students are coming in through test optional conditions. Mm -hmm. And in that case, if a score has been submitted, they look at it, but they're not expecting to see it. So there's no effort to try to drive students to submit scores for, at the test optional colleges. Now, we, we talked about this a little bit back in the spring when you anticipated the move. What does this do for the, the review exercise itself, because uh, to a certain extent, a, a score has always been an objective marker that whether you want it to or not can create a bit of a bias uh, for or against a student. Uh, now that it's completely gone, what- I'll be honest, it's, it's really, really hard. It takes longer to read. Um, it takes more consultation among the readers within a college. I think the, you said we're nearing our conclusion, our actual deadline internal deadline of the colleges to, to tell us who they've decided to admit or what they've decided to do with the early decision applicants is Monday, which means all these colleges are working themselves to the bone all through the weekend to, to feel done. And that's, that's a consequence. And it may, it may have implications for us thinking about staffing in the future. We may need 
we may need to add more reading permanent staff, especially if this is going to continue for another year, which is possible that it will. I don't think that's necessarily all a bad thing. I think the learning that's taking place by having to read, uh, either having to read without scores or having to read without some scores and still trying to be fair to everybody uh -huh. is a really good uh, kind of training. It's a little bit of a trial by fire. Uh -huh. uh, but I'm, I'm optimistic. I've got a very much a very professional, very responsible, very uh, considerate, compassionate crew of readers, despite the fact that they have to turn 90% of the students away. I have not heard any of them say they, they are eager at this moment for the days in which they could more summarily dispense with a student on the basis of a test score alone. And I, I, I have to hope that that may not ever come back. Wow. So, so what considerations do dominate that conversation then as, as they're trying to make fine distinctions between truly great candidates. It's not a matter of sorting out the good and the bad, but having to you know, look at a, at a group of you know, a dozen really, really strong candidates and know that you can only take two or three, what kinds of factors enter that conversation? Well, let me, let me attach some numbers to this that aren't real. I mean, we never talk sure. like this in any admissions office I've ever worked, but if you imagine that maybe two thirds of a decision is largely driven by academic mm -hmm. preparation and one third is largely driven by other elements, character and, and leadership and all the things that uh, also matter about who a person is. I think missing the test score uh, plays mostly on the academic side, but the response is in both the academic and the non-academic side. So maybe now we've moved to more like 60-40, where the 60% that's academic is, we're only able to look at the transcript and a little bit of the assertions from counselors and teachers about students' academic predisposition, maybe a little bit about what we see in the quality of their writing. Uh, but there's, so all those academic weights are now based on all the other things that have always been available other than test scores, the rigor of the coursework, uh, the acceleration and change over time, the most recent experience, all of that. And then probably there's been an even greater growth in how much we want to rely on the non-academic factors as a good predictor of success for us. And again, if that's true and if it holds up, it's kind of all to the good because it's always been the case that the so-called so objective data and a transcript, much less a test score, are not as predictive as we'd like them to be. We always go out, every college goes out and says, you know, the thing that matters most is your high school record, but, but it would be a, a lie to say, and that high school record tells us exactly how you're going to do in college. There's lots of students who do far better than their high school record would have indicated, and there are high, uh, college students who do far worse. Mm -hmm. And so the more we assign value and maybe even metrics and understanding to all the other things that matter in helping us to predict success, the better off we are. Point, point of curiosity, when you're talking about the academic metrics and the rigor and performance through the coursework in high school, how important to your committee review process is the senior year program and performance of a student? Of a student? Well, it's, it's, it's really hard with early decision. And I had, over the course of the summer and fall and talking to my colleagues on the high school side, I had suggested it might be valuable for us to plan to collect some in-progress academic data, the sort of six-week report cards in November. <laughs> a lot of the guidance counselors were not very happy about hearing that idea right. uh, because the, the teachers are just largely don't feel ready to, to make those assignments. And I can't blame them, especially if they're online or half online, not online. It, it would have been a kind of a terrible semester to do that. So I think what we'll see is in early decision, there'll be a lot of caution because we don't have that senior year data and the fall and the spring junior year data we have is often pass fail grading and not, not the same as it would have been otherwise. So there's going to be more caution about academic preparation with early decision. I think by the time we're around a regular decision, there'll be an increased use of the fall semester senior grades and the fall semester senior course enrollments to help guide our choices. So, so the notion that colleges don't really look at the senior year is, is truly a myth? It has always been a myth in, in a bottom line sense, right. meaning even a student who got admitted early decision on the basis of their, their junior year activity would have been subject to another pass, another review, and the potential revocation of their admission. I don't think students want to hear that, and uh, even the best college counselors don't experience it a lot, so it's not really top of mind as they go, but it can certainly happen. It can happen if you drop your your more difficult courses it can happen if your grades drop a lot and it, and not only that it can happen not just on the basis of the fall of your senior year it can happen on the basis of what you do in the spring of your senior year so 
giving in to senioritis entirely is not a good idea. The, the last thing a student should ever want is to receive a letter from the dean of admission after graduation from high school. Yeah. Oh, and it happens. And 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 it's never made sense. You accelerate into college. You don't decelerate into college. And much as I love 17-year-olds, they shouldn't be so tired and full of ennui that they want to just sort of <laughs> take six months off before they head to college. A, a couple of weeks in the summer to let loose? Yeah. An entire six-month period? That's a bit much. Absolutely. Changing the, the, the direction here just a little bit, the effect of the COVID over the last 10 months has been, been undeniable as a health matter, but also as an economic matter. Have you seen any difference uh, in, in the way families are approaching the institution from a cost and affordability perspective? Or is, is there any perceived tentativeness among potential applicants that way? Well, honestly, if that were going to show up, I might expect that to show up in early decision because, of course, early decision students are sort of not giving themselves the opportunity to compare financial aid offers. But of course, our early decision numbers are way up, including our, we're way up among first generation students, which is really appealing and important to us. I don't know, maybe the, the notion of net price and meeting need is now more common. People understand it better. We've got, honestly, weirdly, we've got a new generation of college bound students who are more likely to have a parent who also went to college and increasingly more likely to have a parent who went to college with financial aid. So maybe the average understanding of this is actually growing. I, I, I need to put another feather in Cornell's cap though. On March 31st, our president, uh, Martha Pollack, put out a note saying our number one commitment, as, and that was when the economy looked to be maybe tanking, unemployment was shooting up rapidly. She said our number one commitment, well, I, I call it number one commitment. She, she calls it a leading commitment, was that right. we would continue to meet financial need and continue to meet need blind. So there's never been even a moment of backing off that understanding for our potential audience. Very good. It, it occurs to me also that as families who do have a recognized need and, and pursue the FAFSA are going to be using their 2019 tax return for that FAFSA this fall and are probably feeling a great deal of angst because they're saying, but, but our lives look a lot different in 2020 than they did in 2019. Is, does that come up at all? Do you do anything preemptively to kind of help them understand how to, to manage that informational process? Well, I'd say from a budget standpoint, we're planning for that. We know sure. that the last time anybody went through all this stuff was 2008, 2009, 2010. And mm -hmm. in between then and now, we've gone to the prior prior year measurement for financial mm -hmm. aid, both, both FAFSA and profile. So we expect there's going to be a long tail of economic effects that we're dealing with. And similarly, there's a long tail of students appealing for aid. So some of our lowest income students were, I think, held up by the CARES Act funding uh, mm. through the summer and fall, but they're starting to experience now the anxiety of not having jobs, wages, having costs they can't manage. So we're seeing this lingering number of students initiating appeals after they had already started sure. more so than before. I'm, I'm talking about at any given moment, scores, if not hundreds of students sort of coming through an appeal pipeline. I'm expecting that environment to persist into the next semester and maybe for another couple of years, which is not normal. Normally, you can, normally the, whole, the whole idea of prior prior year is that normally you can count on the wage structure that existed two years ago having some direct bearing on what's true now. That's unlikely to be true, I think, until maybe the class that comes in in fall of 2023. A lot of uh, ups and downs that we're experiencing right now, that's for sure. Yeah. You, you commented earlier about students in the current freshman cohort, within that cohort, seeing more students than usual uh, asking for the deferred enrollment or the gap year, if you will, which plays to a concern that a lot of consumers have right now. Because I can, I can hear a family saying, well, is it going to hurt my son's chances of admission this year that Cornell has uh, so many deferred students from last year who will be coming into the class, will, will that mean that you're taking fewer kids? How, how do you address that question? Well, the answer from Cornell is an emphatic no, but there's an unusual reason that's true. We were planning to grow. So we will have a first year class next year that by design, we're building new housing, it's opening up soon. Mm -hmm. We're gonna be five and a half percent bigger in our freshman class next year anyway. But the other point, and I've had to make this point in many discussions for the last seven, eight months, Mm -hmm. We're really talking about a very small fraction of our total class. I think the possibility of taking a gap year is a commonly thought thing among the people who read the New York Times for their information and, and sort of at the very upper tiers of, of this stuff. And it does seem like a potential consequence. 
but in reality, the, we're talking about potentially the difference between this year our our, our admission rate was t last year our admission rate was ten point seven percent. Even if we were standing still and having the same number of total students coming in, that would drop to maybe ten point six percent. It's 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 dust in the system. It's not going to affect any one student's chances in a way that that matters. Mm -hmm. Wow. One of the things that I think some families might have been concerned about in considering that time off was the potential dilemma, really. Uh, do we want to spend X number of dollars, the, the sticker price, if you will, for a remote education? And the assumption being that, that there's a, a one price fits all, regardless of, of the kind of instructional environment a student comes into. Has Cornell offered any kind of variable pricing according to the, the type of a instructional experience a student might have, or is it pretty much a one, one size fits all? No, we haven't. That, that's partly because we gave every student the opportunity to say they'd like to be on campus or in mm -hmm. Ithaca and not quite, but going close to approximating a guarantee that if they did that and they wanted to ensure they had at least one in-person class, that they mm -hmm. would have that. Um, so I, I, I think the, the, the meat underneath that kind of a re an expectation was not really there for us. Mm -hmm. um, I do understand that places that announced they were fully remote did have those kinds of uh, drop-offs and people saying, I just don't really, I, you know, I know right up front, I don't want to be fully remote, so I'm not going to enroll this year. We didn't have that. We didn't have a lot of students taking a leave of absence. It was a, an increase, but not a, a substantial one in our total enrollment profile either. So that that's a phenomenon that I think matters. But we, we at, at no point did we consider discounting because, as you say, and this is sort of on the back end of this, we're not paying our faculty any less to offer remote and online instruction than they do when they're offering students. In, front of them. in fact, the faculty would probably make an argument they should be paid more because now they're potentially preparing for two different kinds of modalities for teaching. Right. So, so no, our cost didn't go down and we didn't lower our prices either. And people still want to go to Cornell. So that's, uh, it, it, it would seem that that's not a, cost is not a factor. Uh, yeah, I, I, well, there, there's people out there that, that wanted to say that the experience was so different that they had a right to some kind of new compensation or, or mm -hmm. a blessing. But I don't think in the end that holds up very well because a pandemic is a pandemic. We're just as much a, a victim of that as anybody else. And right. unless somebody can be persuasive that our response was less thoughtful than it could be or less robust or, le or less careful and inclusive of student experience, which I, I think would be, at this point, that's going to be very hard for somebody to prove. I'd be interested in, in having a, a brief conversation now about outreach and first as it relates to testing because one of the secondary benefits of testing to institutions for a long time has been that it's an opportunity for places to do some lead generation, to, to buy names of students who have their requisite credentials that, that might put them in a competitive place in the applicant group. If it seems that there's going to be a lessening influence of testing in the admission process and thereby fewer students taking an SAT or an ACT or even a PSAT, do you see that there's going to be a need for the Cornells of the world to, to change at all the way you, you build your admission funnel? Well, I, I think there's potentially that effect across a lot of higher education. I don't think it's going to affect us. We've got average each year between 200 and 300,000 prospects. So these are students mm -hmm. that have at least indicated one way or another that they're potentially interested in Cornell. So that's huge. It, like, at, like everywhere, that's many times the number of students who actually decide to apply in the end. But we've got a big pool of prospects to sort of massage that way. Mm -hmm. Much of that is inclusive of student search, but College Board executed, I'm sure you know, a pretty neat pivot where they said, well, if a student even signs up for a PSAT, we'll, we'll count them in our list of names that are available to sell, even though there's no score to refer to. I think they successfully sold that as an alternative approach. Mm -hmm. And there have been organizations coming along that are creating other kinds of models for developing prospects and, and giving mechanisms for us to reach to the, to the students we want to reach. Mm -hmm. So I'm not too bothered by that. Uh, I think if that were the only rationale or, or a leading rationale for continuing testing, I probably would not be an advocate. It wouldn't be a concern. So then the uh, part two of my thought then is over the last six to eight months, your, your team has had to change the way it engages prospective students. And you talked with me in, in, uh, in April about how much more of that communication would be virtual. How's that work so far? Has it been something that uh, has been satisfying to both you and, and the students? 
Yeah, it's interesting. It's worked so well that I am, I am not sure what will be true a year from now or eight or nine months from now when the, the prospect once again exists of visiting high schools and traveling all over the country and all over the world. We were well positioned to do virtual work. And in the end, we've probably seen, oh, maybe twice as many students as we would have seen through just in-person traveling through our virtual environment including people that could see us many times because they'd sign up for many kind of virtual events. And sure. uh, the, the, the recruiting staff has worked themselves to the bone. That's one of the reasons the readers have to work themselves to the bone now. And I think there's a lot that we've learned that we will continue doing. It's, it's, a, it's fun to have students that you're really talking to from Montana and Western Nebraska that you might not otherwise see, much less students from Oman and, and uh, Paraguay. So uh, I think there'll be some I think there'll be some continuing virtual recruiting activities and not something I thought about in advance, but all those recruiters, the travel time was not productive work time. Getting mm -hmm. on the plane and going four or five hours or being in the car and driving for four hours in a day as you visit four high schools is not, part, not directly part of your encounter with a student. When you're in a virtual world for good or for ill, you can actually do a lot more work that's directly in, in front of students and vice versa. So this, is, this, this time period has given rise to invention, if you will, that has extended your reach, probably while preserving your budget. I, I think there still is gonna come back a need for travel. I think there are mm -hmm. things that happen in an in-person encounter that can't be duplicated. So I think fall travel and even spring recruitment travel will come back, but I think it'll, it'll be complemented a lot by a lot of virtual activity and sort of an expectation of virtual activity including hybrid things where you meet somebody virtually as a prelude to meeting them in person, which was already an idea that existed, but now I think it's going to have a lot of, a lot of currency. And the one thing I don't think that we've managed to replace, and we've got a good campus virtual tour and we're, yeah. we're meeting students in real time, a synchronous tour time, but that's not the same as having the opportunity to be in the back of a tour and look in whatever direction you choose and see what's going on on that campus. So I think I think the idea of campus visits will come back to pretty much its full strength. I don't think that that'll go away. Now, one of the things that I've been encouraging students as, as I've had opportunities to utilize the institutional websites to their greater advantage. So often I think, I think young people tend to do a, a peripheral survey of institutions and they'll say, yep, uh, Cornell has economics, so it's on my list. They have what I want, but they really don't understand how you operate. I, I think that the fact that they can't visit the campuses perhaps put more of them in a position of uh, taking some initiative online to, to learn. And, and your, your website provides a lot of good information for kids. I think that's good if they're, if they're using the time that they've got available to, to, to be more uh, be more successful and, and more thorough in their research. And the websites have always, I would say for at least 25 years, I felt like it's all right there. Our mission, our detail, it's all right there. It's not perfect. And some of it gets out of date. I mean, there's a lot of things that can go wrong with websites. I, I think it's good that students might be engaging with websites more. And we'll just see. We'll see whether that stays in the future with the future cohorts of students or whether they go back to sort of relying on quick and dirty information. I don't know. And this is somewhat related, but is it is it easy for an admission officer reading an application to discern when a student is applying with a sense of purpose uh, as opposed to the student who is applying because it's Cornell and I just want to see if I can get in? Well, that distinction is pretty essential for us because every student is being directed to apply to mm -hmm. a specific college. And the two largest colleges have an undecided major. In fact, technically everybody coming into arts and sciences, which is our largest, is in fact an undecided major. But there's still a real effort to try to determine whether this is a student who's appropriately interested and directed towards the majors and the offerings that that college has. In fact, I think we're actually a little bit mean to a student whose real interest is just Cornell in the broadest sense. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean that in part because there are lots of great students out there whose interest in Cornell may be inclusive of two different majors in two different colleges. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't really have a, a, a way for students to direct themselves toward that. So we're, we're taking a long look at, at what we present and how much we demand of students that they mm -hmm. show that connection. On the other hand, if part of your point is to help students understand that they should show it, yeah, they should show it. And frankly, even if a college doesn't explicitly ask, why are you applying here? It's in the back of mind of every reader at every moment. Why is the student looking to come here and what's the, what's the match? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, my, my intuitive sense then is correct as I yeah. uh, try to help students. 
I'd like to kind of wrap up with a slightly different type of question here. Given the uncertainty of the times, what are maybe one or two questions that you would advise families to be thinking about as they embark on either the college search process or they've got applications in or about to be submitted? What are things that, that maybe families are underestimating now about the process and about the circumstances of the process that they, they should be making more direct inquiry about? Well, there's some trouble brewing out there in the financial model of higher education. So I think if I were a, a, a smart family being heads up about my plans and needs, I would be thoughtful about that. I'd be wanting to make sure that the college that was offering me the deal of a lifetime was also well positioned to, to be there 10 years from now, much less three or four years from now. That's, that's, a, that's not a huge risk. I think we're talking about struggles at maybe 10% of, of the institutions in U.S. higher education, but it's, it's, it's a non-zero risk. Um, the other thing that I hope families are going to ask a lot about is uh, to what degree are, are colleges really being thoughtful and direct on two big fronts? Because I think they matter to almost all students, uh, at least as far as I can tell, on some level or another they matter. And I think it's kind of an important set of questions to ask. One is, what is that college's commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, racial justice. We've all seen that this is a big part of the dialogue for our country, and we have to understand how colleges respond to that both ways. How are they protecting speech and rights and opportunities for all, and how are they dealing with the, the issues that invariably crop up in mm -hmm. this racial divide that's a part of our country's history? And the other one, which I think is probably even more universal among college-bound students, is what is this college doing about climate change? Are they providing opportunities for me to participate and learn uh, in terms of research, in terms of teaching, in terms of activity? Are they caring about whether or not my, my own kids are gonna have the chance to go to colleges in the future? Because if you've got a college that says, nope, we're, you know, we're sort of shining on on that problem, I hope you don't really wanna go there. You want, you want colleges invested in this question. That's great advice. I think that so often it's the case that, that young people kind of live in the day and, and don't think beyond where they are to, to what tomorrow might look like with regard to social justice or climate. And, and, and I think that the, whether they're candidates at Cornell or anywhere, it's really important to, to become reflective on those, those issues and understand what their sense of purpose might be. John, this has been great. I, again, I appreciate your taking some time to, to talk with us about the current state of affairs at uh, Cornell with regard to the college admission process. And I wish you, you and your colleagues the very best as you head into the, the winter months. Uh, hopefully it won't be a dark winter for you. <laughs> no, I think it's beautiful. Uh, this is glorious. Here. Okay, good stuff. Well, for those who have been listening, hopefully this has been an insightful conversation. John, thanks again. Everybody have a great day and be safe. Take care, everyone.